This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. I'm particularly glad to be here just because over the years I've had a good and close relationship with UCSD in general. I've been often to the schools here as a Pacific Leadership Fellow a couple years ago at what was then IRPS, now a GPS. Connect itself I've been very admiring of and very interested in the way that it's done work here to catalyze progress in San Diego. With that as a theme, I'm going to give you two little avenues of setup for the questions I'm going to be asking um, our, our panelists. The first is about the San Diego situation in general. What I have been fascinated to learn on previous visits to the city, talking to entrepreneurs, talking to researchers, talking to people at Connect, is the way the best known parts of San Diego's tech um, achievement, that is in the biotech and whole uh, biological realm, and in the telecommunications realm, the way in which these things have been willed into existence in this area and have made the San Diego region a leader around the world in those two fields. We're going to hear about the ways in which some less well-known parts, until you think about it, of the San Diego um, infrastructure have, have already developed what they are doing now, where they might lead for the, the future of, this, uh, of this, this region. So the ways in which we're going to try to put in the other part of the puzzle, in addition to biotech and to uh, mobile communication, we're gonna hear about some other parts of the high-tech infrastructure that is going on here now. The other thing that is interesting to me is my wife, Deb, who's here in the second row, and I have, over the last couple of years now, been going around the country looking for versions of this story in other regions. We've been doing a series for the Atlantic and for Marketplace Radio called American Futures. We've gone to communities smaller than this that have had some kind of economic shock of one kind or another and have seen the way they've been able to use their resources to find some new path for themselves. I have a cover story coming out in the Atlantic just in about two weeks from now about the things we've seen around the country I'll tell you, I'll give you only two previews of it, which uh, will affect our, our discussion. One is that, that one of the themes of my article is that if you listen to the national political discourse these days, i.e. if you turn on the TV, you basically want to kill yourself because you think <laughs> this is a country that can't do anything, can't agree on anything, that, is, that takes what is its supposed point of pride that is its system of government, and it's finding a way to do more clumsily with that than almost any other uh, country is doing. So one, one of my, my themes is going to be that if you look at any part of the United States except the national governing level, you see a country that actually is responding quite well. You see cities that are where the typical narrative we've heard around the country is, boy, America's in trouble, but here in Sioux Falls, things look pretty good. America's in trouble, but here in Greenville, South Carolina, things are going pretty well. America's in trouble, but here in Mississippi, things are going pretty well. So the kinds of dynamism we're seeing in San Diego, uh, we've seen a lot of other places. The other local note I'll tell you is that in our list of cities that suffered some kind of shock and then came back, we've seen a lot that have the same kind of story that you could use for some uh, for the creation of the local biotech industry here, how that came to be with the Salk Institute and everything else. But somehow my editors would not let me write about La Jolla as a struggling community that somehow was fighting its <laughs> way back. So I will just, I'll, I'll keep the La Jolla story just to our confines <clears throat> here and anybody, uh, anybody else who, who, who is, is watching. So what, the where we'd like to get by the end of this discussion, and you can ask questions if you feel we're leaving things out at the end, is understanding, number one, the parts of the tech and research and, and uh, entrepreneurial economies represented by the three organizations and the three people you see on the stage. We're gonna understand more about 
what they're doing and why they're doing it here. That's going to be one stage. We're then going to talk about uh, the sort of the over and unders of their doing it here. What are the challenges in San Diego? Where, what are ways things could be getting better? We're also then going to talk about the possible ramifications and network effects, that if San Diego wanted to have more enterprises like this, is there anything it can do? Could it get out of the way? Could it provide more connect-type networks, et cetera? We're going to talk about the pluses and minuses of defense contracting. We're going to talk about ways in which our business leaders would change the world if they could, and mainly end up with a sense of where this part of the regional economy stands now, what are the forces uh, propelling it and perhaps retarding it, which of those are within the whole community's ability to change, and what we can learn about doing more of the kinds of things that these companies and their leaders and the people they know too, uh, the, what they've already achieved. So that's basically where we hope to get by the end of, of our discussion. We have three different kinds of companies with different sorts of products, although they're all in the high tech, often uh, defense tech or some government con contracting realm, but they have very different stories in San Diego uh, from, from a very long tenure in San Diego to a relatively brief tenure. We could say in San Diego, but with looking for, uh, for more. So we're gonna, I'm gonna start by asking each of our panelists to give us essentially the story of his company, not the hour long keynote address, not the 10 second elevator speech, but the couple minute precis of the problem his company has solved, why it's solving it here, and what are the main interesting things about its dyna dynamics pro and con. We're gonna start with Mark Keith of Solar Turbines. Who has seen the Solar Turbines um, factory in San Diego? So we're gonna hear more about Solar Turbines has been here for a very long time. So Mark, why don't you lead us off telling us about your company, why it's here, and what's happening to okay, it. Okay, thanks Jim. Can you hear me okay? Everybody, all right, sorry, I'm, yeah. I'm kind of getting over a cold, so forgive my voice. You took my question, I was gonna raise that hand. <laughs> sorry, you can ask it That's again. okay, so I was gonna ask, how many of you have been to the airport, and we're that building next to it, right? So <laughs> I, I think that's what I find, and I heard in the, in the social before, not a lot of people know what we do. Uh, so I'm gonna attempt to kind of walk you through what we do, and, and what solar connected to a turbine means. So, um, we started with the oldest first, so we've been around since 1927, you heard that. We started actually as a company called Prudent Aircraft Company. So in 1927, thought would be, and it was technologically advanced at that time, to build airplanes out of metal, completely out of metal. So from 27 to 29, actually built three airplanes, and in 29, depression happened, and we thought, well, that's not so good of a business. So. At that point, we took that metal know-how and moved into, we changed our name to Solar Aircraft Company and moved into metalworking. Um, the solar at that time, that's when it came into being. Not a lot of solar panels around in 1929, uh, but the leadership at that time uh, loved the sun in San Diego. So truly, believe it or not, that's what it comes from, uh, is the sun in San Diego. Now, different, it's, it's different connotations today. But throughout like World War II, our experience in metalworking, uh, pretty much every aircraft that operated in World War II ran a solar turbines exhaust manifold. Uh, we got into that even during the war. We, in being innovative and creative, we made mess kits, milk jugs. Over the time, that's where our experience formed. Uh, we then started getting contracts in the 40s, 50s, and 60s with the Navy. Uh, started getting into turbochargers and higher temp applications for materials. Uh, then moved into turbine technology, smaller turbines. Uh, used them in the 50s and 60s for propulsion of marine vessels, uh, Navy vessels, even on minesweepers. Uh, as you continue to explore uh, improving the efficiency of a turbine, you want to up the temperature in a turbine. So that really created a whole new realm of innovation for us. And I'll stop right here and just briefly, tough to see, especially with the blowback from my bald head <laughs> off these lights. Um, how many people know what a turbine is? Okay, that's good, big percentage of the audience. So if you think what a turbine is, you take it off of an aircraft wing and where on an airplane that you fly on every day, it drives a turbo fan. Instead of driving that, we drive generators and we drive compressors, uh, natural gas compressors, anything that moves fluid. Um, so around the 60s and 70s, we decided that was going to be our business. We would use turbines to um, 
uh, essentially function in a wide range of applications. Um, throughout the years, I'll pretty much fast forward through the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s, and as our internal technology grew, um, we started seeing this application of power needed to be highly efficient and low emissions. So you get to the 90s and we started looking at how we could lower our nitrous oxide or NOx uh, and CO2 emissions without applications of fluids or any other things, actually led the industry in that regard. Um, and then you take us all the way to today where we are providing really from an application a few examples, a turbine at Rady Children's Hospital. Uh, how many people remember the power outage a couple of years ago, right? So you'd be pleased to know that during that power outage, the surgeons at that hospital could keep on operating because our turbine provided backup power. We provide power for all the Bagram Air Force Base um, in Afghanistan. We provide natural gas offshore power platforms, huge customer of ours, the oil and gas industry. Uh, and if you turn on the gas dial at your house, I promise you that natural gas has been moved by solar turbines. Where we're at today, uh, to kind of wrap up, we are really exploring alternative fuels. Um, we can run our turbines on everything from natural gas to liquid diesel like you run in the car. But also in the green area, we can run off of the gas that comes from a landfill. Uh, gas that comes out of steel manufacturing called coke oven gas in China, and we are now running turbines on hydrogen and syngas. So I guess a summary, two-minute summary of right. the technology we're in. Maybe you didn't know that was it. We have two facilities, one at Harbor Drive, one in Kearney Mesa. Thank you very much. So how many people here thought that Solar Turbines was actually a solar energy company? So we are now clarified. I see they're shy. They're not actually. <laughs> yeah, guys, they know they're on film. You guys are either the smartest group <laughs> yeah, ever. So I think we're, we had to be at least one, I would have thought. <laughs> Great. Thank you very much for, for right. setting out. So now, Rick Baldridge, you have a, your company's been here for about 30 years. So tell us essentially the comparable story of your company, why it's here, what the main dynamics are, what are the interesting both uh, challenges and opportunities that you're dealing with. Yeah, so our company was founded 30 years ago by three guys, uh, Mark Dankberg, Steve Hart, Mark Miller, and, and they worked for Irwin Jacobs in Linkabit uh, before Qualcomm. So Mark ran the government SATCOM piece of Linkabit, and when Linkabit was sold and those guys left and formed Qualcomm by a set, uh, Mark, Steve, and Mark were one of the startups. I think there's some 60 startups from Linkabit or something. I think we're... Yeah. Uh, one of the, one of, if not the, the most enduring and successful one of those startups. I like to think we're the most successful. So they started in, you know, they, we started in Carlsbad because that's where they lived. That was the main reason. They wanted a short commute, so they started in Carlsbad. <laughs> and uh, it's been great because we don't really compete up in that area for talent that much. Uh, it's, it's been a really good location for us. They went after government SATCOM business initially. They, when, I, when I joined in 99, it was about 90% government business, mainly focused in security and satellite communications, mostly selling equipment. Uh, in 2008, we announced that we were going to build and launch our own satellite and go into the satellite inter to home internet business. And our, our stock, stock fell almost 50% that day. <laughs> <laughs> was one of those really big days. Uh, spent the next six months trying to convince investors on the road, trying to convince investors who weren't that stupid. And we, in 2012, we launched the large, highest capacity satellite in the world, uh, 140 gigabit satellite, and that's more satellite, more capacity than all the satellites over the U.S. combined oh. at the time. So uh, pretty exciting. That's the reason we waited till then to do it because we're waiting for the technology to catch up. And so we've been in the service, our fastest growing piece of our business since then has been our services business. We're now over 50% commercial and over 50% services. We're now building uh, the new highest capacity satellite in the world. It's about close, about two times the size of that one. Um, we have about 700,000 residential subscribers and we have been acknowledged by all the independent trades as the best internet on airplanes. Well, if you fly airplanes, we're on JetBlue, we're on half the 
United Fleet, and we're now on uh, Virgin. We had a big announcement recently where and they painted a plane, side of the plane with the house of cards. They made, did a deal with Netflix. You can stream your Netflix over the airplanes. We're on with Virgin for free. Uh, JetBlue announced a deal, similar deal with Amazon Prime Video where they're streaming for free. So it's real internet and it's free. So uh, you can do that when you, when you build really cheap bits. Just recently, though, we announced that we have a design for three satellites to cover the globe, all the visible Earth, three geo satellites with over a terabit of capacity, over a thousand gigabits of capacity on, on these. So another pretty huge leap, it's our own payload and we should deliver the first one of those in the 20-ish, 2019. The good news is when we announced this one, our stock didn't drop by 50%. <laughs> so people are starting to believe that we can actually do, uh, do what we're doing. So we're, we're, we love the area, we love the universities and the relationship we have with the universities. We think that the innovation uh, that's occurring in San Diego is ignored pretty broadly. Uh, I was meeting with Greg the other day. We, San Diego County has, is the second leading county in California in producing patents. Hmm. I think Qualcomm is fairly heavy in, in that area. <laughs> we have a few of our own. Uh, uh, we won a lawsuit with our patents here a, a year or so ago. That was a top 20 award ever, that lawsuit award ever. So I think innovation and, and protecting those, those innovations is kind of the heart in San Diego. So we're really excited about helping foster additional startups in the environment. And I work with two organizations to help do that. So that's one of the things that I think Steve Hart, one of our co-founders, and certainly me, are spending some of our time on. Thank you, and just one follow-up question for what you've said. I have a million questions for all of you, but, but what's the, is there a way to explain simply what's the technical edge that allows you to have so much more throughput than, than your competitors? Yeah, uh, his name is Mark Miller, and one of our <laughs> co-founders. Yeah. It was like Andy Viterbi or something. He's, uh, uh, it's really having the best people and thinking about the problem differently. So if you think about how the satellite industry has made its money, it's by owning uh, real estate in space and having everybody point their antennas at it and then charging as much as they can charge for that capacity. And there's billions and billions of dollars invested in that space. So they didn't want this to happen. They don't want the price of bits to come down. So when you enter a market and the incumbents want to protect the thing they have and you kind of tell them what you're going to do and they don't want it to happen, it might be a good idea. So, so that we think that people, we, don't, we haven't heard any customers asking for less data or <laughs> slower video. Yeah. <laughs> So we attacked that problem. We, that was how we approached it. And I think, uh, and it was kind of funny, but Mark Miller would say, if, why, didn't, why don't all engineers think, think about <laughs> solving this problem this way? And I think engineers do, but companies don't. Great, thank you. So we've heard so far from Mark Keith about the story of his San Diego bread company, which came from an early start in, in aviation to a different kind of turbines and, and did its work here. We've heard from Rick Baldrich about something which again was San Diego spawned from, uh, from Link a bit and all the things that, is, uh, that have spun out from there and the ways in which it's now expanding. Now we're gonna hear from, from uh, Greg Johnson about who is the newest comer to San Diego. In fact, the center of your business is not actually here yet, right? And so, so tell us about how the Center for the Advancement of Science and Space, what it does, what its ambitions are, and how San Diego fits into your view of the world. Do I have 120 seconds? <laughs> yes, you do. You have 140 characters. <laughs> <coughs> okay, so uh, NASA, which we are not, uh, we're a nonprofit outside the government, but NASA has largely controlled uh, space-based um, re, well, low Earth orbit microgravity research and tech demo uh, for decades. And um, NASA, the country, the world invested in the International Space Station. And a uh, $100 billion asset uh, took over 10 years to build. And we completed the space station assembly uh, just four years ago. And so as NASA and I use the pronoun we because we're, yeah, I feel that we're part of NASA, uh, 
built the space station and in the, in the 2005, 2008, the country increasingly realized that, hey, this space station was a great investment and we need to best use, use it, not just to understand long duration space flight and how to, how to go beyond low Earth orbit for exploration, but how to solve problems here on the Earth. And NASA has always had a mission to planet Earth, but Congress mandated the creation of a nonprofit just four years ago uh, to focus on the mission of, of, of discovery and innovation to solve problems here on the Earth on the International Space Station. Hmm. So uh, we complement what NASA's been doing, look through a different lens, gather innovative, non-traditional uh, users, for the International Space Station. So why would you want to use the space station? Well, microgravity, the only US, actually the only uh, laboratory the world has in low Earth orbit is the International Space Station. And the only place where we can get continuous microgravity uh, for more than a few seconds in a drop tower or uh, maybe 30 seconds in a parabolic flight or even a few minutes suborbital to get continuous microgravity, the space station is the only place we can get that. And so when you take the gravity vector out of the uh, problem, you can learn new things. And so biotech, drug discovery, cell inter interaction, gene expression, and microgravity, things change in microgravity. Materials uh, uh, change and, and, and they respond differently. Uh, we also are outside of the Earth's atmosphere, so that environment can be used as a test uh, location to test sensors. And they don't have to be high TRL sensors. They could be, you know, lower tech sensors that aren't quad redundant and test them on the space station. And then finally, observing the Earth. We have this uh, campaign, uh, Good Earth, where we're trying to use the unique asset of the space station uh, to uh, better understand sensors that can study the Earth and how to get that data, maybe uh, slice and dice it on orbit, and also how to communicate that data down to the ground and then distribute it out to the users. And the users could be all the way from humanitarian all the way to commercial users. So a lot of innovation can go on the space station. It's not just NASA's space station. It's the countries. It's the world space station. Our mandate is to use the space station to solve problems here on the Earth. And am I right in thinking that Cassis, is that the right pronunciation? Cases. C cases. cases that is part of the, I've spent too much time overseas, I guess, so I'll call it, uh, Cases, that, that it's part of the national lab, <laughs> national lab system? Well, we're not part of the national lab system per se, but we are a de designated yeah. national lab. You know, Department of Energy has the majority of the national labs. Uh, we're a different model. We're a yeah. different kind of animal. We're a, we're a nonprofit, but we get uh, some federal funding. We're expected to collect non-traditional funding sources, all the way from philanthropy, which is sort of difficult in this in this environment. But uh, angel investing, uh, uh, you know, uh, investment uh, from commercial companies, uh, and um, also sponsored programs that come from institutions. So. The Mass Life Sciences Center, for example, made a half a million dollar investment in um, solving problems in space. So uh, it's, I guess the, the answer to your question is uh, we're, we're a different sort of animal right. than a lab because we don't just have a, a driveway that you drive up to and do the work. A lot of the costs that, of, of these projects are the transportation. Yeah. And that's the value proposition that we have is that the transportation through CASIS yeah. is free. Well it's provided by public funds. And so we, we have an opportunity for opening the ISS for business and solving commercial problems, as well as those problems that just NASA has been focusing and on. And just to follow up for, for one clarification, so as a special kind of national lab, are your ambitions, to what extent are they commercially to, to um, spawn some kind of activity or is it more in the pure science realm? No, we're actually expected to help develop commercial demand. Right. Um, I mean, event, you know, the space station was a big investment, and uh, there are going to be follow-on space stations. Yeah. And so building that commercial demand, building the interest, solving problems on the space station is what's going to spawn the follow-on space stations. Right. 
So we have representatives here, leaders here of three very successful organizations. And we know that success for any kind of business organization is a combination of lots of things. It's the entrepreneurial spirit, and it's the cleverness of your engineer who had the right kind of uh, vision, and it's local circumstances, which we'll talk about in San Diego, and it's national and international trends. And also in what all three of you have discussed, there's been a matter of government policy and defense policy too. Since San Diego has been so heavily affected for decades by defense contracting, by government presence. We'd like to, to draw out a little bit what is from, both from a company point of view and from a national point of view, what we sh should think of as the good parts and the complicated or bad parts of relying on, on government contracting or defense contracting. Um, let's start with, with you, Mark. You were saying that there were certain kinds of turbines you were doing for government contracts, I assume for military contracts. How do, does your business and how should new businesses think about the embrace of federal and defense contracting? Yeah, okay, so, and let me clarify a bit. I, we, we've probably been out, we still do a little bit of government yeah. contracting. Uh, probably the, the bulk of the contracting that we do with governments are actually internationally, right? National oil companies, national power companies. Um, we kind of had a, a period of time in there where we were doing direct uh, contracting with the Navy. We still do a bit mm -hmm. of that, um, but uh, they're using a different source of power now, so not our turbines. Um, I guess if I could maybe, just to have an answer, to, to kind of spin that a touch, one of the advantages we have of being in San Diego, which we really take huge advantage of, is the border, mm -hmm. right? Um, so. Um, we have 7,800 employees around the world, 3,500 of them work here in San Diego, 1,000 work just across the border at TurboTech. Um, and so, um, and we have 15,000 turbines, 106 countries around the world, so we're a very diverse company. So I'll tell you, I would more rather shift that answer, if I could, sure. to kind of government policy. For us, uh, making sure we have an open border, right, that we can move technology and thought across from here to, the, to Tijuana is a huge, play, huge thing for us. Uh, making sure that, that policies enable business rather than stand in the way um, would be more how I would rather answer that. Because yeah. we're, not, we're not in the day-to-day -day right. contract business with the government, but we're heavily influenced by decisions they take. And, um, and, and I'm gonna step in for a moment on this point you're, you're making. So uh, if any of you have watched TV in the last three or four months, you know the prominence and the salience of immigration as an issue. It's fascinating that a year ago, before the current sort of spasm in politics, Pew did a study nationwide of issues around people's mind. Border issues and immigration were number 15 on the list of issues people were, were volunteering as, as, as big, big threats. If you do look at polling now, there's essentially no correlation between the areas that have the largest immigrant presence and where there's, there's most uh, political uh, concern, concern about it. Um, am I right in inferring from your comments that you think the, um, the furor at the moment in politics is misplaced? I'll maybe try to avoid that. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I, I think what I'll, I think the way I'd rather say it is I think we need to continue to explore. You know, we, if you go back historically, 65% of late, and that's maybe something you didn't know about solar, of our business is export business, yeah. right? Our parent company is actually Caterpillar. They're a huge exporter with a lot of U.S. jobs. So free trade agreements, continuing those, making sure we have the right border policy that lets the flow of knowledge. It's very important to us. And, and so even diversity of talent is important to us. And along those lines, I will make the tie back to the military. Uh, we, the number of ex-military people that work at Solar because of this location, whether it's ex-aviation, Air Force, Navy, whatever, we get a lot of our technical talent there as well. So I guess I'd answer it if just continuing to make sure we're, we're allowed to compete fairly around the globe would be great. Thank you. what I'd like to see. So let me have a version of that question for Rick Baldrish. That space communication satellites are fascinatingly at the intersection of almost every trend here. They're national and they're international. They're public and they're emergently private. They're military government and they're non-military government. How has your company navigated these shoals of dealing successfully with both defense and other government contracts? And what's the sort of policy uh, lesson you would give to our viewers about how to think about the government as a sponsor of, of innovation? Well, I mean, that's how we get started, so we're a big fan to start with, so. Um, and we like the mix of businesses. I remember when, 
in, in 99 and 2000, people said, sell your government business, it's all about this broadband stuff, and then the market crashed in 2001, and they said, forget about broadband, and we, we love your defense business, and, and so, you know, good news is we ignored all that, and, and, <laughs> uh, yeah, and so we move engineers back and forth across those platforms, and you know, really, really good technology investments on the government side, and the engineers learn new software skills, uh, new hardware designs, new uh, integration of new parts, and those guys move over to commercial programs and they take those skills with them. What we've seen is, is uh, the government is really good at inventing things that don't exist because they have a warfighter need, and those things take a long time to get into the, in, in, into the marketplace, but at some point in time, the commercial markets, to the extent that's applicable, satellites is a really good example, outspend the government and move that technology well beyond what the government's done, and the government becomes a user. Cellular technology, the internet, all those things are examples of that stuff that's happened. That's what we see happening. They're reluctant, because they still want to buy, they want to buy, be able to buy things from five different people, so if you're 100 times better than someone, they don't like that. <laughs> You know, they want to lower, and they want multiple sources of supply. They struggle, but at some point in time, they buy it. You know, they'll, we know what communications ultimately worked in Afghanistan, and some of those marketplaces were things that people bought commercially. So uh, we, we like the back and forth between the government and the commercial piece. So I have a question for you in your role as citizen but informed by your expertise in, in, in your company. One is about whether, so we look back, we can say, oh yes, decades ago, the government set up DARPAnet, now we have the internet, it did DNA, original research, now we yeah. have La Jolla, et cetera. First question would be, are there things like that now that people 30 years from now will say, oh yes, in 2016, the government was, was, doing, was doing X. And um, I guess my other question would be is, do you feel from your vantage point that the government science agencies basically know what they're doing when they're, when they're making these investments. <laughs> I like your uh, dance there. <laughs> now don't, I'm not, right. I'm not government, you can answer that question. <laughs> Good question. <laughs> My little brother used to say, ask me another question. <laughs> so, uh, of course, there are, and most of them, you know, most of them you don't talk about. Uh, obviously, that's where drones came from. I mean, look what's happening with the, with drones. And so I think they, I don't think they say this is going to be a huge deal. I think they're trying to solve a problem. They're trying to solve, uh, uh, you know, how do we, how do we find people that are hiding in caves with sound or with communications gear, with, you know, multiple different technologies, or how do we, you know, you, you, you know, how do you miniaturize a nu nuclear power plant and stick it in a boat and uh, stand her underwater for, you know, a long period of time. So they, they, out of necessity, innovate in a way that the commercial marketplace doesn't see a need to. And then the commercial marketplace becomes a user of those advancements. So, yeah, I think there's a lot of them going on, a lot of them going on today. One of them, you know, in, 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 in the microchip mar market, in, 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 you know, space is one of the things that, you know, brought us, you know, tremendously forward in, in, in the silicon space. So, uh, yeah, I, I, and I see some things, uh, most of the stuff I see that are really strong investments are things we can't talk about in public space. Interesting. Yeah. Except, <laughs> except yes. Space. So, so I will. I'll just. I'll, I'll make up a question you. you can use as as the T for whatever. You, so you're in in a realm right now that is fundamentally funded by the government with with uh, both defense and, and and civilian. How do you think about the? Well, just tell us what you know that we should know about the kind of innovation and basic science that you see being performed at the space station. Well, let me. Uh, I really wanted to respond to what yeah, you too. said, Rick. Go for it. Because. <laughs> The government has invested, now. you know, with the with the partner nations to build yeah. the space station, a hundred billion dollar asset, and um, this low Earth orbit activity is emerging. It's right at the beginning of the the model that you're describing, and so the government looks to us as the first step to help 
generate that commercial activity because ultimately um, commercial companies will be hopefully paying for and running and having good business cases in low earth orbit. And so, uh, and there's lots of possibilities. There's space tourism out there and, and, and you know the players. Yep. Uh, but also using the unique aspects of low earth orbit, you know, the microgravity, the environment, you know, the, the earth observation capability and building those technologies. Uh, we hope and no pressure <laughs> to uh, create that commercial demand that will that will progress in the spectrum just as you speak. So, did the government make a good investment? And that and that's that's a, a great question. I say absolutely. And the and as the 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 inventors and the creators on the ground realize this laboratory that is available. And oh by the way, the government now has given us access to 50% of this asset. And so it's not going to the moon or Mars. It's overlapping with that mission. So we're trying to actually solve both problems. Osteoporosis, for example. We need to better understand astronaut bones to go to Mar moon and Mars. But there are millions and millions of, of humans on this planet that are afflicted with osteoporosis. And uh, microgravity is a, is, a, is a great place to study that because normal, you know, healthy organisms, uh, actually their bones degrade about 2% per month. So if you, if you solve the problem of going to the moon or Mars, you're also solving the problem here on Earth. So that's one of the really low hanging fruit op opportunities for us to solve problems. But we're hopeful that that's exactly what's gonna happen. And I, I don't think I answered your question, Professor. Uh, <laughs> I, and I call him Professor because he wrote a textbook that I studied at the Air Force Academy on national defense, and I asked him not to yeah. pull me into policy. And so. in my defense, I, I was 28 when it came out. So. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> so. I got an A in the class. So. So, All right. Uh, we, we were fated 30 to 30 years me. ago, sir. So, so I have a, uh, one follow-up question. Stipulating that you want more emphasis on space, we all want more for what we're doing. When somebody writes the technological history of this era 50 years from now, will they say that the United States was investing properly in this frontier of science, or will this be seen as an era of, of great underinvestment? I absolutely believe the first, the, the fourth. Was, um, and I'm hopeful that exactly what's happened with the satellite business is yeah. gonna happen uh, right. on the International Space Station. We're gonna or in low Earth orbit. Yeah. Okay. We're gonna shift to the local angle now of things about, um, about San Diego. And <clears throat> Greg Johnson doesn't know, but he's gonna lead off this part of the, of the discussion because we're gonna ask, what are the traits that make the San Diego environment attractive to or less attractive to, to, to enterprises? You are in the position of deciding how you will expand your activities in San Diego. As you look at San Diego relative to some other parts of the country or the world, what do you find here as things that, that are, are strengths? What are weaknesses that the area should, should work on? Okay, so that's a, a big question and, and we're freshmen yeah. in, in this area. But uh, thank you to Connect and, and uh, the, the friends that we've built over the last uh, several months and actually more than that. Uh, but I would say that we're a small nonprofit. We have about 40 people and, and, and 11 board members. Mm -hmm. and so about 50 total uh, working toward this mission. And so we have to focus in ecosystems. And so we started on the East Coast. We're Florida based. So we started you know, in Boston uh, and, and the Space Coast and Houston as a natural ecosystem, and then Colorado, and now we're focusing further west. And so San Diego is part of the West Coast ecosystem, if you will, you know, Seattle, uh, Silicon Valley. But I don't want to leave anyone out here on the California coast, <laughs> but our flagship conference is here in San Diego mm -hmm. this upcoming July. And so uh, we made that choice because of the, the clusters of activity uh, in, in innovation um, and uh, you know, biotech and the sorts of problems that we're try trying to solve on the space station. I was speaking to a gentleman before uh, the, this uh, panel uh, about the cluster, the aerospace yeah. cluster here uh, in the area. And those sorts of collaborations are exactly what we're hoping to gather uh, through organizations like Connect to pool resources and collectively solve problems. Great, and one follow-up for you before we go to Rick Balters, which is that what strengths and what weaknesses do you think you as an outsider observe here that are not noticed by the locals? 
strengths and weaknesses of, that of I the, noticed. Of the San Diego ecosystem. Well, the weather is beautiful. <laughs> no, uh, no I, I, I can't speak to uh, weaknesses. I, I, um, I have learned a lot about the San Diego area recently, uh, but uh, it's a very fruitful environment for aerospace, for technology, that we're, you know, uh, telecommunications, uh, biotech. It's exactly the sorts of groups that were, and, and educational institutions. Yeah. I mean, this place is fruitful for the activity that we're trying to do. And oh, by the way, we have a education mission. So uh, we're also trying to help develop that next generation of uh, engineers, scientists, and explorers. So. so let me ask you now, Rick Valdridge, you're from a company that's been 30 years old here. It was spun off from one that began even before that with, with Link a bit. As you've seen the, the environment for startups and entrepreneurs and tech pioneers here, is it improving? Is it degrading? How has the, how's the San Diego, what's the San Diego environment of 2016 hmm. like for the next generation of tech companies compared to 10 or 20 years ago? Oh, I think it's improving dramatically. Yeah. You know, I, you know, I think that uh, the companies before didn't have a, there was no ecosystem, mm -hmm. you know, so they were doing it themselves and, and, and uh, you had pioneers that made it happen. And I think once Irwin did it a couple of times, uh, and you know, there's others, but he's the one I'm more familiar with. Uh, some people built, you built confidence. We had, there's a lot of failures that came out of that, guys that didn't make it. And because I think a lot of it was because there weren't the kind of infrastructure. So Connect provides some of that infrastructure. Evo Nexus provides some of that infrastructure. There's, uh, there's a lot more support for that. I spent a bunch of time in the Bay Area. They're better at this. You know, they're, they're, they live and die this. But one thing I notice a big difference is it, the tendency there is let's start a company, let's grow it, and let's flip it. Yeah. Here, the tendency, and, and I think you know, Qualcomm was a really good example. I think Viaset is another good example. And you guys certainly been around. It's let's start a company, let's grow it, let's build a, let's build something that's lasting, and it can grow. And I, I, I see a more of a tendency for that here. Than I, than I see in the Bay Area. There's some, some of the guys that are different than that. But, uh, so I, I like that. I think that the environment is completely supportive. I think UCSD has played a really strong role. San Diego State's got a, you know, a, a entrepreneurial program that's, that's pretty supportive. So I, I, a lot more tools. I'd much rather be starting a business today yeah. than I would have 30 years ago. Yeah, great. So uh, Mark, again, your company's been here the longest of, of, of any of them. Uh, I'll, I'll give you a variant on that question. Are there any factors in the San, uh, San Diego environment which have ever made solar turbines think of going someplace else? Yeah, I would say probably, and blame's the wrong word, I would say it's probably more of a Californian state issue than, than a San Diego issue, right? We do, we do test turbines, so at times emissions, things will happen, um, you know, Let's, 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 yeah, emissions, <laughs> right? What, so we're testing turbines that go all over the world, right? A lot of them will have uh, low emissions technology on them. Some of them won't. So we have to watch that very closely, right? So um, we've overcome that, right? We work very closely with the governments and, and local authorities, and we're, you know, we're constantly driving that down. But, you know, other parts of the world, that's part of having a manufacturing base here in California, they're not up to speed, right? And they still want a product. So I would say in those areas, um, we face some challenges. Um, we face some challenges which were very public and in the press, right? Having a manufacturing facility on Harbor Drive, right? And some pretty <laughs> prime real estate is, yeah. if you were building one today, you wouldn't walk into a city like this and go, yeah, that's a good spot. <laughs> probably, <laughs> pro probably wouldn't be able to get it done, right? Yeah. So we've, we've faced challenges there, but I will tell you the one thing that we've seen, and, and I'll kind of spin it to maybe try to answer a couple of these. One, one thing that we've really appreciated is, is the support of the community. We had a lot of the community come out and support us when, when some of the challenges we're handling uh, were going on with a, another place beside us um, downtown. Um, so we're a big donator to charities in the communities. I think that reflects. Um, and, and then really the strength that we've always been able to rely on because we pull a lot of engineering talent um, is UCSD uh, and San Diego State, right? We, not only do we hire talent from there, but we, we leverage research opportunities with them. Um, and we're very proud, one of them sitting in the audience, right? We have a, 
a very diverse workforce. Um, and so the diversity within San Diego and the focus on diversity in the STEM fields, particularly women engineers, mm -hmm. a lot of award winners at Solar who have won many awards. So while we face those challenges, the one strength I would say we feel here in San Diego is the support of the community, right, to, to keep us here. There was a comment, I won't quote who it was, I heard it through my president, said, man, if painting the palm trees pink downtown will keep solar here, we're gonna paint them pink, right? <laughs> so um, we feel that support. And so that was a politician, by the way, but I won't name who it was. <laughs> so somehow I'm not shocked to hear that. But, okay, but, but no. then well trained. Yeah. So we have just a couple of minutes before we end this part of the discussion. So I'm gonna ask each of you just in a minute or so, this is the, if I were king, if I were uh, Shaw uh, stage of, if there were one thing you could do to sort of change, to improve the environment for high tech progress, startups, innovation, job creation in the United States or in San Diego, what's the main thing you would like a crowd here or viewers online to, to what, what would you do? So we'll start with you, Greg. I'd say it's about opportunity. Mm -hmm. I would hope that not only just the CEOs, the CSOs, the COOs, but also the, the researchers that are solving the problems, the, the actual scientists would better understand the opportunity before us. Mm -hmm. We have one decade, uh, hopefully a little longer, to use this unique asset in space. And right now, the value proposition is amazing. Mm -hmm. The only cost is incremental cost. And if better understanding, if you could take the gravity vector out of a problem, makes it fundamentally simpler, you could solve that problem. Takes a low maturity technology up to space, you can test it, and then you can, then you can replicate it for your, uh, your satellites or other, other technologies. Uh, and developing materials, for example. Is there a material you want to? Uh, that's, I, you, know, you and I are going to talk. We're okay, find a way, so, we have found a way to make a blade in space. That would absolutely. Be cool. So that's what I, yeah. I would want people to talk about the opportunity Great. of using the space station. Great, so we have the one thing to do to talk about this 10, this 10 year window to take advantage of this. Yes, so uh, Mark, what, what's the one thing you would like people to know or do, or you would do if you were king? I think if I were king, I, I, I would improve the velocity, right? I, I tend, you know, velocity to action. I think I look at, we've been with Connect for four years and probably haven't plugged into those companies as well as we could have and the opportunities there. Um, and I see it sometimes with, with other areas. There's a lot of talk, right? And we spend a lot of time debating and talking, and I'd love to see us doing, right? And, and um, that would be what I would change, right? Find a way to get the right ideas in the right forum and then go experiment. And if you fail, fail, but then move on to the next thing, right? We, we tend to move a little slow. And, you know, and this is going to sound really weird. I don't know. New Star Wars movie out. I'm a yeah. big Star Wars buff, I must say. But I, my son handed me a coaster the other day, which, which really reminded me of that action, right? And Yoda's famous for that. He said, do or don't do, there is no try, right? And I, I wish we could end the debate and just move on with things. Great, thanks. Rick Baldrige. Yeah. Education reform. I, you know, I, I think that uh, you know, we need more kids in engineering and science. And, and you know, I, there's, there's a lot of that going on here. There's not enough. So, you know, we, we, that's what's going to change San Diego. That's what's going to help, you know, the innovation space here. So uh, just more and more and more focus on education reform. And I, I don't see that heading the right direction. And so I spent 10 years in Texas, and they're mandated 20 kids to one teacher. You know, I walk in classrooms here, and there'll be 35 kids in a classroom. And, and I don't think you can, we can't make the kind of progress we need to make that way. So speaking not to the California situation, although I'm a product myself of Southern California public schools, but the whole national perspective, something that Deb and I have seen around the country actually is a lot of experimentation in science and tech education. For example, in Greenville, South Carolina, there's a place called the Elementary School for Engineers where they have these little kids in a poor neighborhood who are learning engineering at age six or seven. So join me right now in thanking our excellent panelists on their presentation. Thank you.